Hello. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome. And thank you all very, very much for joining us for the inaugural session, the inaugural uh, talk of our colloquium on the behavioral economics of philanthropy. Uh, in this series, we're going to explore the changing landscape of philanthropy and in particular how behavioral economics, the learnings from that uh, field of discipline uh, brings to bear on philanthropy and how philanthropy is changing as a result. Some of the things that we see in the world of philanthropy that are new and different as we move forward are uh, new platforms for giving, new ways of incentivizing uh, philanthropic giving, uh, new approaches to bringing uh, new donors into the field and bringing new um, givers that previously were not philanthropically oriented but bringing them into, the, into play and also uh, ways to focus attention on specific uh, problems, specific issues uh, that uh, deserve attention and deserve funding. So to, uh, to launch our series, we are extremely fortunate to have with us uh, Chris Frangione, who is the Vice President of Prize Development at XPRIZE. XPRIZE is a fascinating group, and they uh, present themselves as being the world's leader in designing and managing large incentivized prize competitions that motivate and inspire brilliant innovators from all disciplines to leverage their intellectual and financial capital for the benefit of humanity. Chris is uh, really involved in all levels of the XPRIZE and is very well versed in their operations. And he describes where he works as being at the intersection of audaciousness and achievability. So, with that uh, lead in, Chris, I will hand Thank this you. off to you. And Thank you. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about the prize model in general, and then also tie it into how it's a new model of philanthropy. But it's kind of hard to do that in pieces, so I'm going to lump it all together. I encourage you to interrupt me if you have questions. I get very bored talking. Um, and, and doing this presentation, I can do it in my sleep. Um, so, so feel free to interrupt me. I may tell you we'll get there, and, and, but, but don't take that personally. So, oh, we lost some, we lost some slides, uh, some words. Um, so what if we could make the impossible possible, right? What if we could figure out a way to adequately house refugees or displaced people you know, the, with refugees, the average time in a refugee camp is 17 years, right? What, what if you could give them a better experience? Or what if you could clean up the plastic in the ocean? Or what if you could educate kids without access to schools or teachers? Or what if you could solve the climate problem by taking carbon dioxide out of the, the atmosphere, right? And, and we believe, or what if you can make people happy, right? Do you know the way we know if people are happy is you ask them a question like 100 times a day, are you happy? Five minutes later, are you happy? Right? It gets pretty annoying, right? So we believe we can, and we believe you can use prizes to solve many of these major problems that are facing humanity. And in fact, prizes already have been solving many of these problems for over 300 years. So let's do a little history lesson. So if you go back to 1714, the British government was sending goods all over the world, right? And and lives were being lost at sea constantly because of rough conditions. And we were able to tell where we were on a latitudinal basis, but we were never able to tell where we were on a longitudinal basis. And so the British government, because they cared about people's lives, or maybe they cared about their goods, put out a 20,000 pound prize for the first person that could figure out where we were on a longitudinal basis. And they actually assumed this would be a ship's captain or astronomer that would win this. But instead, it was a clockmaker, a clockmaker who made a simple time device. And that British government, when they put out that prize, they assumed the best anybody would ever get was 20 nautical miles from where they thought they would be. This clockmaker made a simple timepiece that in 1761, when the HMS Deptford hit the shores of Jamaica, it was off by five seconds, meaning one nautical mile. And in fact, this guy never actually got paid. He had a fight. Because the British government's like, uh, a clockmaker can't do this. It wasn't a ship's captain or astronomer. Fast forward, 1795, Napoleon was doing a good job invading countries. 
Funny thing, when you invade countries, you have to feed your bigger and bigger army. And so Napoleon put out a prize for canned food. And 18 years later, or 12 years later, it was, it was won by somebody that was a candy maker. And what was really nerve wracking about this prize is the way that the prize was awarded was Nicholas Appert made 18 varieties of food. It went out on a ship for many, many months, and then Napoleon's army ate it. Right? I mean, that's, I would be very nervous if I was that inventor, right? They got botulism, they got sick, they didn't like it, but it turned out great. And in fact, prizes became kind of a family affair for the Napoleons. Uh, his cousin was facing a butter shortage, and we have margin because of a prize. We also have billiard balls because of a prize. I mean, plastic because of a prize. When ivory was becoming scarce and being outlawed, somebody put out a prize to create a replacement for it, but it had to have the right density and the right things. And, and some of our plastics came from that. And then, of course, Charles Lindbergh, 1919, flew across the Atlantic for a prize. Six people died before him in the attempt. And it was a simple attempt. All you had to do was fly from New York to Paris or Paris to New York nonstop, and uh, hopefully you lived. And Charles Lindbergh did everything different than everybody else had done. Everybody else had two or three people in the plane, a pilot, a co-pilot, and maybe a navigator. Everybody else went with a two or three engine plane. Lindbergh said, you know what? If an engine goes down over the Atlantic, I'm dead anyway. So I'm going to go with a single engine plane to save weight. He sat on a wicker chair. He cut the, he cut the edges of his maps everything possible to save weight. And instead of flying around storms, he came up with a new way to dead reckon in the air so that he could fly with a storm. And so he wouldn't have to use fuel and carry as much fuel. He, he did everything different than everybody else. Right? He had only been flying for three years. The, the media called him the flying fool. And he hated that, but, but that's what they called him. And, and a lot happened within a single year of his flight. The number of passengers increased 30 times in three, or sorry, the number of pile applications um, went up 30 times in three years. The number of people flying went up drastically in a single year. It absolutely created the commercial aviation industry. It, this was not the only prize, by the way, in the commercial aviation industry, but it was one of the ones that really, really flipped it. And everybody assumed in this case it was going to be a Navy pilot or an admiral or whatever it may be that would win it, and it wasn't. So fast forward to 1996, my CEO, Peter Diamandis, um, read The Spirit of St. Louis, the autobiography of Charles Lindbergh. And Peter always, and there's somebody in the audience that actually knows Peter well, um, Peter always wanted to go to space, and he did everything right. He, he has a medical degree. He has a PhD in astro blah, 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 something space related, right? And he always wanted to go to space, but he knew that he had a really some chance to go to space. And while reading The Spirit of St. Louis, he realized that you can put a prize out there. Nobody had done prizes since around World War I, World War II. The flipping point of, from doing prizes to not doing prizes was when the government started throwing a ton of money at innovation. Prior to that, prizes were how we really got a lot of our stuff. But all of a sudden, they had to throw a ton of money at innovation because they were in a war, right? They had to build that military establishment by throwing money at it. And that's what really killed prizes for a while. And so Peter said, you know what? If I want to go to space, I'm going to have to create this myself. And so he launched this prize called the Ansari X Prize. And it was very, very simple. All you had to do was fly to 100 kilometers twice in two weeks with a three-person crew or the equivalent of a three-person crew. And it had to be privately funded. These are very important things. I'm going to give you a little insight into something I'm going to speak about in a minute. But 100 kilometers up. So that is something that's not too audacious, but not achievable. Meaning, if it's too audacious, nobody's going to spend any time to do it. Right? They're going to say, that's a waste of my time. I'm out. Because remember, teams are spending their own money to compete. If it's too achievable, you just wasted your own time and effort because somebody could win it tomorrow. <laughs> and actually, a little background, it was originally 100 miles up. And we changed it to 100 kilometers because that was way too hard. And, and unfortunately, in this country, nobody knows the difference between 100 kilometers and 100 miles anyway. So it turned out OK. Twice in two weeks was a proxy for cost. So if you look at JetBlue or Southwest Airlines, they flip their planes in 20 minutes, right? They're in and they're out. 
What did NASA do with the space shuttle? How long would it take to put another space shuttle up? A year, right? Eight months, 12 months, 14 months, because they took the whole thing apart and they put it back together. By saying you had to use the same spacecraft within twice in two weeks, that was saying, I have a reusable spacecraft. Three-person crew made sure that there was some commercial aspect to it, right? So you can have a pilot, a co-pilot, and a paying passenger, or really brave passengers and autopilot, right? And then privately funded, obviously, was the whole point in the, in the thing. So we had 26 teams from seven countries. And what's really impressive about it is if you look at all these different approaches to it, and, and they spent an aggregate over $100 million. And then on October 4th, 2004, White Knight, which is the main plane, carried Spaceship One, and the prize was won. From a marketing standpoint, a little lesser known thing about our organization is the X was actually a placeholder for a sponsor. Peter launched this without a sponsor. And so he, he was gonna be whoever prize. It was a one-shot deal, right? And, and after it took eight years to get a sponsor, the X stuck, right? It became our brand. So now we say it's the intersection of achievability and audaciousness. So we put a spin on it. So what's really cool about what happened there is that the, the uh, Spaceship One, which one aren't, sorry, X Prize, is hanging next to the Spirit of St. Louis in the Air and Space Museum. Even cooler for this generation is that we got the Google Doodle. By the way, I don't think you guys realize how hard it is to get the Google Doodle. Really, really, really hard. And then as we know, commercial space flight is here. Um, that's Blue Origin's rocket just, that just vertically took off and landed, and that's SpaceX Dragon capsule for passengers. And you saw that NASA is now going to rely on um, commercial, uh, fund, commercial providers to bring people to space. So now let's, oh, let me just tell you a little bit about XY. So, so we've awarded over $30 million in prizes ranging from space to highly fuel efficient vehicles to oil cleanup to um, ocean acidification. We have active about $85 million in prizes right now, ranging from space to Qualcomm Tricorder, which is for a handheld health diagnostic, to this Global Learning X Prize, where you're going to educate kids without access to schools or teachers, um, to an adult literacy prize, to our most recently launched um, $20 million prize to deal with carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. In November, we're going to be launching another prize, which, or December, we're going to be launching another prize, which we're very excited about. We are a 501c3 nonprofit. So we um, do not retain any of the IP from the competing teams, nor do our sponsors. Um, but there are organizations out there like Deloitte or PricewaterhouseCoopers that do prizes where they, we call them private label prizes, where any corporation could do it and they can keep the, um, keep the IP. So we're not the only one doing this work. We just happen to be one of the few nonprofits doing it. And so if you look at where prizes are, are fitting, there's a lot of corporate prizes where where the corporations actually want IP out of it. There's a lot of government prizes where they sometimes take IP or they sometimes don't. And then there's this philanthropic side, right? So on the philanthropic side, we're seeing a new crop of philanthropy coming into this because it's very different than traditional grants or contracts. It's a very different way of thinking it. And if you look at how we view the people that are important to us, our stakeholders, we really see two sets of clients. One of our clients is the person that gives us the money to launch the thing, right? And the other client are those teams that are competing. And so we have to find what motivates that person giving us the money. And more importantly, we have to figure out what motivates those teams to compete. That's a really important piece of this because it's so drastically different than a grant or a contract. So let's, let's really quickly think about a grant. Sometimes people will call things prizes that are really grants, but what is kind of the basic tenet of a grant is, okay, you give a proposal and I accept your proposal and then I give you some money and then you go do something, right? And maybe you bring me back something decent. Right? Same thing as a contract, right? Very, I know, I know they're much more complicated than that, just, but just roll with me for a second. Grants are significant, I mean, prizes are significantly different than that. And they're becoming popular right now with philanthropists for, for a few reasons. There's certain attributes of the prize that really hits philanthropists. 
This is the ability to do something that is completely open, where you can get anybody from around the world to compete. People that are in the industry, but more importantly, people that are not in the industry. Go back to that grant or contract. You're gonna go with the known quantity, right? Because you're investing in one or two or three people or companies or organizations. And so you're gonna take that proposal and you're gonna evaluate that proposal and you're gonna say, I'm gonna accept this one and I'm not gonna accept that one. You're not gonna take the high school kid right there that's competing for one of our prizes, right? You're not. Because you're gonna look at him on paper and you're gonna say, what the? Heck no. It's not worth my risk, right? But philanthropists love this idea, especially new money. If you start thinking about people making money in Silicon Valley or the tech world or wherever it may be, they look at this and they say, holy cow, nobody would have taken a chance on me. Right? Maybe some angel investor did, or, or I was able to talk somebody into giving up some money so I could be successful. And I was successful. So they love that idea that you can get those people. They're also used to working in a capital market. right? They're successful because they built a product and brought it to market. Prizes are heavily focused on that end market, and I'll go into that in a little bit of detail. Then if you look at kind of the social trends, there's a lot of frustration with conventional grants and contracts, right? Mostly that they don't disrupt things most of the time, right? Normally you get a really good idea, but you don't get something totally crazy good, right? And a lot of new philanthropists are looking at things that they disrupted some industry, they want to disrupt this problem. Right? So whatever, whatever that problem be, global education, um, healthcare, whatever it may be, they want to disrupt it. There's also this idea that anywhere, anyone from anywhere truly today can do anything. Right? I mean, between all the exponential technologies that are out there, 3D printing, the internet, AI, whatever it may be, every single person in this room has access to experts all over the world that you could tap at any moment in time to form a team to compete for a prize. Right? And, and that is allowing these prizes to be successful. You know, it was a lot harder 300 years ago because only a few people were able to compete for them. But we're seeing many, many people. And in fact, I've been at XPRIZE for five years. Um, and I should have said, my job at XPRIZE is I run the team that designs all the prizes. And so we're kind of the R&D side. And then when we, when we go to launch a prize, we hand it off to another team that's more process oriented, right? Um, but even in my five years of XPRIZE, we've seen us go from fewer teams spending a lot more money to many more teams spending less money because of these exponential technologies and because of the resources they now have access to. So let's talk about why prizes are powerful. Prizes focus a community. This is really important to philanthropists, a community of practice, right? So we design things into prizes. Good prizes have things designed into them to actually force that community and force that collaboration. But the, the, key to think, the key thing to keep in mind is that these teams are not competing for the prize push. You're going to hear me say this over and over and over again today. They're competing for something else. They're competing for the market. They're competing for the tools that we give them. They're competing for the community. In most of these industries where we launch prizes and where prizes work best, the market isn't working for some reason. Either money's not flowing into the market or there's a public perception problem with the market or there's a regulatory problem. So many of these markets, these barriers, these market failures are impeding the ability of that market to move forward. And a prize, can help take down those barriers one way or another. And in doing so, using the old adage, a rising tide floats all boats, right? So these teams are willing to work together and compete against each other because they know when they go out to that marketplace, I may not be the winner, but there's still a market for me out there. So let me give you a couple of examples of, of where we see these, this collaboration and these communities happening. In our Google Lunar X Prize to land a lunar rover on the moon, drive around, hopefully make it through a night, send back some data. Sounds easy. Um, we have a team summit every year. A couple years ago, the team summit was in Chile. The Chilean team paid for the hotel rooms of every single team that was not from Chile. I mean, these are people they're competing against. And our Ocean Health X Prize, this was for ocean acidification. We had a high school team. 
And that high school team made it to the semifinals. And they went in and they put out an Indiegogo campaign to raise the funds to get to the, get to the semifinals. The largest contributors to that fund, remember this is a $2 million prize, were actually other competitors in the competition. Because they thought it was so important to get as many of these technologies out to the marketplace as possible, even though they knew they were risking losing if this high school team went forward. Right? <laughs> Another great example is during our Progressive Insurance Automotive X Prize, this was for highly fuel efficient vehicles, the teams had seven weeks of on site competition. And during that, we said, you know what? If you want free garage space, here's a hanger. So it's going to be your car, toolkit, tool stuff, your car, toolkit, your target toolkit, right? If you want private space, go rent your own. One team rented their own. Everybody else shared. And in doing so, people shared information, people shared tools, teams merged. We see teams merged all the time. That's the community you're trying to build. And that's what philanthropists love. Right? They want to go attack a problem with as many tools as possible. These ideas, they come from around the world. So if you give a grant or contract, you're betting on one or two or three, right? I said that a little earlier. But with a prize, you're betting on a significant number. I mean, look at this. Our Global Learning X Prize has 198 teams from 40 countries. We would have had significantly more if we were allowed to take teams from countries we have sanctions against. I mean, we are a US organization, so we're held to US laws. Um, but just look, I mean, it, it is very impressive where these teams are coming from. And they're somehow collaborating across time zones, across distance. Philanthropists love to leverage their investment, and prizes are a great way to do that. So in a, in a prize, the teams are spending their own money to compete. And oftentimes, teams will, well, historically, teams would spend more money than the prize person. We're seeing that less now with more teams competing. But in aggregate, we often see teams spending in, you know, 10 times the prize purse or more. So if you look at these numbers, so the Ortigue prize, that was the one Lindbergh one, the Ansari X prize was our space one, our highly fuel efficient vehicle, and then this uh, Lunar Lander challenge. What's, what's impressive about this is that if you look at the R&D in aggregate, that is going out to solve the problem, that's what you care about. Now, many people push back on prizes and they say, that's a really inefficient use of R&D, right? I mean, why do you need 100 teams spending money to solve this problem, right? The response is the market can take 100 teams. The market can take more than that. So look at that global learning thing. They're all gonna come up with different solutions and they're all gonna have a niche in the market or they might compete head to head in the market and that's okay. We don't believe there's an inefficiency in this aggregate R&D spend. This is the most important. Prizes democratize innovation. So this is a high, I know there's professors in the room. This doesn't have any science behind it. We know it's true, but there's no real numbers. So totally awesome chart, right? Probability of success and the value of the idea of a solution going from zero to a whole lot. So if you do a traditional grant or contract, you have a really good chance of getting a really good idea. Why? Let's go back to that proposal, right? I know who you are, and I'm going to invest in you, and I'm going to invest in you. And you don't want to let me down, because you know I might invest in you again in the future, so you're going to do a good job. But are you going to take that crazy risk that's going to give you a breakthrough? No. Maybe you will, but rare, very rarely. If a prize looks something different, so a prize, still you have a very good chance of getting a good idea, but you have a much better chance of getting a really good idea, and a much better chance of getting a really, really bad idea. But that's totally okay. Because instead of betting on one or two or three teams under that blue line, you might be betting under 100 teams under that orange line. And why are these people willing to take that risk? One, they're looking at everybody else and saying, holy, Crud, if I want to win this, I got to be better than everybody else. Or two, well, and two usually, they just really want to make a difference. They want to do something great so they could win the market. And everybody says, okay, I get, I get this. That's awesome. This is kind of silly, but I, I can buy it. We also like to joke, that's the Jamaican bobsled team. So did nothing, nothing from the standpoint, technical standpoint of advancing bobsledding but great from a story standpoint, right? They brought tons of viewers to a sport that is kind of boring. 
<laughs> so let's look at those prizes. That longitude prize, we talked about it, it was a clock maker. The, the canned food prize, it was a candy maker. The Ortigue prize, it was the flying fool. And our ocean health prize, high schoolers. In fact, we've had high schoolers in all of our competitions. And I was just saying to somebody earlier that we actually used to design these like cute little prizes, like, oh, go have fun, high school students. Like, go, go play nicely. You're so cute, right? Condescending. And then they started competing for our big prizes. And we're like, oh, it's on. So we started getting rid of those. <laughs> and in every competition, we have a handful of high school teams. So this is, this is a great story. These were siblings plus some friends from high school um, designing an ocean acidification, um, a better pH sensor that could go to depth. And uh, this, we just had an event in Washington, DC, and they're meeting with some congressmen and senators. And they were, they were hilarious. Um, tattoo artist. Tattoo artist who was really passionate about a problem. I don't know if you remember, back in 2010, Deepwater Horizon, but we launched a prize for surface oil cleanup after that. And, um, and there was a tattoo artist and a basketball coach that partnered. There was also a commercial fisherman. Commercial fisherman who did really poorly in the competition, but his technology was a fishing net that could fit in a 55 gallon drum. Did he do as good as the industry standard at the time? No. But imagine if every fishing boat in the Gulf of Mexico had a 55 gallon drum sitting on their, their deck that as soon as that oil started spilling, they could whip it out, hook it up and start cleaning up instead of waiting for weeks for the cleanup technology to come down, taken out of mothballs, right? So thinking about that democratization of innovation, if you were giving a grant or a contract, like a traditional organization, you would never have invested in one of those teams. You can, you can sit here and tell me you would have, and I'm gonna tell you you're full of it, right? You never would have. And, and that's where the ideas are coming from. So this is one of the places that philanthropists love this because you're getting those people, nobody would have bet on them, and you're getting these people they wouldn't even bet on now, right? It's, it's ironic like that. Um, prizes do a great job in telling stories, changing public perception, helping people understand what is possible. And a lot of philanthropists this, these days get the benefit of that, right? It, it helps them. Somewhat selfish, but it helps them. We have some philanthropists that like to not use their names, and that's totally fine. Right? Our Global Learning Prize is just called the Global Learning X Prize because the funder, who I'm allowed to say is Elon Musk, and a bunch of other philanthropists didn't want their name on it, right? That's great. So we see lots of stories being told about, about our prizes. Um, this is really beneficial to the teams too. By the way. So what's awesome about this is if you're hosting a prize, if you're a philanthropist and hosting a prize, you get all this while only paying for a successful outcome. Great. The teams pay their own way. <laughs> teams take all the risk. That is fantastic. So why? Oh, let me show you this in the graph, because it's kind of entertaining. Um, this is from a professor at Harvard. Um, so if you are doing a traditional grant or contract, you define the problem, you find the right workers, you incentivize the effort, you monitor the effort, you, 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 right? Keyword, you. And then at the end of the day, Chung and Chik, you pray for success, because you don't actually know what you're going to get. But if you do a prize, you still have to define the problem. You still have to set the evaluation criteria. You still have to set the prize, but then it's them, them, them. And by the way, a lot of your students, right? So would you rather do the assignment that the professor tells you to do? Are you sufficiently motivated to do that besides the fact you want a good grade, besides the fact you want to graduate? Or would you rather pick your own assignment? What's something that's passionate to you, right? My guess is it's going to be the latter, unless for some reason you like totally love the professor. Um, but at the end of the day, you pay for success in this case, right? And that's really important. Yes? I'm just wondering how difficult it is to develop that evaluation criteria, um, especially for some of the really challenging problems that you're talking about. So yeah, so it is not easy. And we sometimes get it wrong, right? We fail just as much as we're successful. And that's OK, because we, we have the ability to adjust. We spend six months designing a prize. 
we end up crowdsourcing most of it. We interview anywhere from 50 to 150 experts. My team is mostly researchers, writers, and facilitators. <coughs> they are not, they are topic, they are subject matter experts in certain subjects, but they're often working on prizes that have nothing to do with their subject matter expertise. And, um, and so it takes us about six months to design the prize, re interviewing 50 to 150 experts, doing all day brainstorming sessions, because we're trying to understand what, where the market is now and where people believe the market will be in X number of years. So say 10 years, and we'll say, okay, you have to do it in two, right? So we're, we're backing up. And, and what, what the benefit that X Prize brings, and a lot of these people designing prizes, is that we're able to talk to stakeholders that would never talk to each other. So take that carbon X Prize I, I mentioned earlier. We went to the utilities and said, okay, so right now in this country, there is no carrot or stick to get people to do anything about carbon dioxide. There isn't, right? If, if there's no regulation, so there's no stick, and there's no carrot. In fact, if you attach a carbon sequestration or carbon conversion technology to your power plant, you're gonna most likely lose 30% of the electricity out of your power plant. That's a horrible business proposition, especially when you don't have to do anything. So also, you put your air quality permit at risk. Those are pretty valuable things if you own a utility, right? And so if I came to you and said, look, I have this great carbon conversion technology, I wanna slap it on your power plant, you're gonna say, oh, hell no, right? So during the design of that prize, we knew the people that are gonna adopt this are utilities and manufacturing facilities. So we went and talked to them and said, okay, what do you need to see to prove this is possible? And they say, full scale, and then we'll attach it to our power plant. And we say, okay, that's a little BS, let's, let's discount that a little bit. Um, and then we go to the innovators and we say, okay, for this amount of time, this amount of money, what could you deliver? And they say, this. They say, okay, you're trying to get away with really easy, let's go here. And so you guys have probably heard of the zone of potential agreement, right? So there's a ZOPA there, um, and that's where we try to find the sweet spot. But it is not easy, um, and we're constantly restructuring things. Did you have a question? Mm -hmm. To what extent do you see that the people who are competing in this are capitalists? Yeah. To what extent is it missing out the market? That's a great idea, but can't afford it. Absolutely. So it's a very, very good question. And, and I'll get into that a little bit, but I'll give you a little bit of a preview. What we do, um, and sometimes more successfully than others, is we try to keep that barrier to entry really low at the beginning, right? So pretty much anybody can compete. And then, and then there's some down selects or there's some, something that happens and all of a sudden it gets harder and then it gets harder and then it gets harder. And at each of these points, we give milestone prizes to some number of teams, right? So that not enough for them to drop out of the competition, but enough for them to fund themselves going forward. We also spend a lot of money educating teams on how to raise capital, how to do crowdfunding. We bring in, we bring in um, VCs, we bring in private equity firms. We bring in consulting firms to teach them how to do business plans. We bring in people to teach them how to do road shows. We all know that the best innovators aren't the best business people. So our job is to almost act like an incubator and make sure all those teams that go through our competition can make it out to the marketplace. So we have that problem all the time. And we've sort of figured out a way to help it. But at some point, they have to get the capital. But that's no different than being out in the marketplace. right? They're going to have to find the capital in the marketplace. Right, so, so I will tell you where, in a minute, I will tell you where prizes don't work. So prizes absolutely don't work when it's like something where the market is gonna be small at the end of the day, where you wouldn't get a grant. I mean, where, where a grant makes much more sense. So take like tuberculosis diagnosis, right? We've been diagnosing tuberculosis the same way for many, many years. You go, you get this thing, and then two weeks later, you have to see if a little thing popped up, right? And then you have to go back to where you, to, to get it checked out. It'd be great if there was something that could happen in 30 seconds. Um, there's not a huge market for that. So, so that's a better for a grant. Basic research, absolutely much better for a grant. Basic scientific research, don't ever think about a price because you will never be successful because they will be spending money and not, and not having that. So there's absolutely places where a grant works better. So since you're functioning like an incubator, mm -hmm. do these innovators form their own companies? Mm -hmm. Everybody that registers for our competitions have to be a legal entity, however they want to be that. We have to write a check to a legal entity, but most of them form companies on the competition. 
I'm curious about the donor engagement side. Mm -hmm. So, so it comes both ways, right? So we've had times where a donor has said, um, I'm interested in this topic, go design the best thing. Never works, right? Because they have in their mind something that's interesting to them. We've also had times where the donor said, I'm gonna put somebody on your team. Absolutely doesn't work, right? Because they have, um, you know, they, they have other jobs. <laughs> and so what works the best is that we just keep in touch with our donor and tell them the direction we're going, understand, their capacity to fund, right? So if we know at the beginning kind of what their checkbook looks like, then we can design along that audacious achievability scale anywhere, right? And then at the end of the day, our board has to approve it so we won't launch something just because a donor wants it. We'll say, go ahead, take this to a private label company and that's fine, but you know, we are a 501c3, so we have to meet certain criteria. Um, but we try to stay in touch with them all the time. So, most of my team are ex-management consultants, so we actually refer to our donors as clients. Um, we need to make our clients happy, otherwise we can't change the world, right? So, um, so we can plot this, uh, only paying for success, another highly scientific plot. If you do a traditional grant or contract, you kind of spend, right? Obviously, it's not totally true. Um, and then if you do a prize, it's, you, you have this low level of spend and then a, a peak when you, when you award it. So the teams, this is that other set of clients I was talking about, that other stakeholder. We have no competition without the philanthropist or the corporation. A lot of our prizes are corporate funded um, and we have no prizes without the teams. So you saw this slide, it's just a reminder. Um, the prize purse absolutely matters, it does. But it only has to be a sufficient prize purse. It's a really important word, sufficient. It doesn't have to be huge. You no, know, we always argue that's not about the Benjamins, right? It's not only about it. If it was, you wouldn't have had a team spend 27 million to win 10. And you wouldn't have had a team win $250,000 and turn around the next second and donate it. Literally the next second, right? So what is it? So if you look at when, when you are making an investment decision, there is some investment threshold with some uncertainty, right? And then there's some market incentives and non-market incentives. And hopefully those market incentives and non-market incentives go over that investment threshold and you say, absolutely, I'm gonna invest in this. But a lot of times that's not the case. So sometimes a prize in those markets that are stuck, whether it be a regulatory problem or technological problem, public perception problem, can actually fill that gap and help you move over that investment threshold. And these are these hard and soft incentives. And, not, and I'm just gonna briefly touch on, this is how we get people to compete for our prizes. So if we have a $10 million prize, we have at least $10 million in operations costs. Right? And that's because of these incentives. So soft incentives are those things that the teams can't actually go out into the marketplace and buy. And hard incentives are those things that teams could go out to the marketplace and buy if they had the capital. Right? So what are the soft incentives? That's the cause. This is you know, mostly around the work we do um, and other nonprofits, but sometimes when they're competing for a corporation prize or something, they also want to do because of the cause. Um, making a difference in the world, interesting work. Legitimization, this is huge. Nobody believed a private company could put a plane in space until a private company put a plane in space. Right? Until somebody put out $10 million and said, you know what, you could put a plane in space. Building a market either during the competition or after the competition. There was no commercial space flight market after the competition. It's still struggling. We actually created the Commercial Space Flight Federation, which is a trade association, to support that market. And we do that a lot. We help to build markets. Glory and prestige, pride, it's fun, the attention. People love attention, people love to compete. Um, but then the community is one of the biggest pieces, right? This is the access to experts. This is the networking capability. This is things that you know, is hard for you to do on your own unless you're part of a, of a community. Um, I'll give you an example on the community piece. We've recently, in our last two prizes, allowed people to register as individuals. And the platform we use will allow you to actually find the other team members. So you could register as a team, you could register as a team missing a piece, or you could register as an individual looking for a team. Right? And we're trying to build that. This is why we do our team summits. They're mandatory. We make people show up. If they don't, they're kicked out of the competition because this is such an important piece. 
If you look at, yeah. It's it's mostly the um, the the capital component, right? It is how hard is the prize, the audaciousness of the prize. So, if we're asking you to give me something after two years that is market ready, you're already working in that market, right? If I say you only have to get me one tenth of market ready in two years, you could be anybody. <laughs> and so that global learning one, the one that has 200, it's a software prize. Anybody can do software. Well, I can't. Bet you everybody else in this room can though. But, but so it's really based on what we're asking and, and where we fall on that spectrum of audaciousness. So these hard incentives, these are the things, again, they could go out to the marketplace and buy. They can go buy education. They can hire a consulting firm to do their business plan. They can hire a VC, well, I guess you can't hire a VC, hire a consulting firm to help them do their roadshow, right? Capital infusion, they could go out to the market and figure that out, right? But we try to build that in. But the big one, is this validation and resources. We spend a lot of money testing. That global learning one that they're gonna, each of the top five finalists are gonna get to test on 1,000 students each in Tanzania. We just got 8,000 tablets donated to us from Google. We have to build solar infrastructure in these villages so that we could test these top five solutions. And, and that is huge to the team. Those teams would never be able to afford to go out in the marketplace and buy that. We will spend millions of dollars. But why are we doing it? We're not only doing it for the teams, we're doing it to prove the world this, is, this works. Because if it actually works, then other people will invest in it. So we're trying to send out to the marketplace validated solutions. Anybody can go on Kickstarter or Indiegogo or whatever and say, you know what, I got this cool, great new clicker. Right? And, and you're gonna invest in it, and you're gonna invest in it. Sweet, I just raised a million dollars, and somehow I have to figure out how to actually make it and deliver it, right? With the prize, you know it's been proven. We tested it. So thinking about how do you design a good prize, they need to find a sweet spot on a series of spectrums. So you need to decide if you're looking for a transformational change or incremental change. What is your goal? Then you need to think about, is it achievable? How achievable is it versus audacious? Is there a big follow-on market or a small follow-on market? No, that slide, that arrow is not wrong. Everybody says, Chris, your arrow is wrong because everything's bigger on that side. There's a reason. Um, and then are you taking any IP or are you open sourcing it? Some of our prizes we open source. We never take IP. Um, and the, the further you are on to the right of any of these spectrums, the more operational incentives the bigger prize purse, and in most cases, the more time you need to give teams, right? So those, those hard and soft incentives, we call those operational incentives. It's a nice way of telling our sponsors that they're spending money on something that's like, I just wanna put up a prize purse. And we're like, well, you have to incentivize the teams to compete. So, cause you can imagine, you have to give them a bigger prize purse if you're taking their IP, right? So an example, our global learning prize, software prize, educate kids. Our adult learning literacy prize, software prize, educate adults. Same thing. $15 million prize because the solutions are open sourced. $7 million prize because the solutions aren't open sourced. In this case, only the solutions developed during the competition are open sourced, and then they can go close them again when they make any additions to it. And good prizes are built on, on a very important solid foundation. You need to address a market failure. When you go to the doctors, you want them to cure your disease and not your symptoms. If you don't actually figure out what is hindering that market, you're gonna fail. You need to define the problem and not a solution. This is really hard for people, and grants often define a solution. We just say, you need to do A, B, and C. And as long as you do A, B, and C, and not D, E, and F, because that's really bad, you win. Sure, it might have to fit in this box, but we don't care. Just do it. You have to have an audacious but achievable target. It has to be inspiring to people. But they also have to know if they try to win it, they have a chance. Otherwise, they're going to look at it and be like, mm, thanks, i got other things to do. Right? You need to have a clear measure of success. The teams need to know if I do A, B, and C, I win. They're spending significant amounts of money. And if 
all of a sudden it's muddy, they go, mm, not interested. You want to be able to tell great stories. You want to make sure there's a follow-on market, even if you have to build it. It's really important. Otherwise, there's not as much incentive for them. And then it has to be rewarding and simple for the teams to compete and us to operate. So most of our prizes, we care about cost. As all of you probably know, it's really hard to measure cost on a prototype. Every cost model can be gamed. Every cost model is based on assumptions, right? And so we always try to find proxies because that's easier for us to operate. And as I said earlier, prizes don't work for everything. They don't work for basic research. They don't work um, when there's not going to be an end market. They don't work if there's a lot of capital already being flowing into that market, right? There's certain places it just doesn't make sense to put a prize. And these are really important things to keep in mind because I do a lot of, I do all of our government relations stuff and I, and I deal with the government and senators and congressmen love, 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 love prizes. But they want to replace all funding, right? So most of my conversations with them are, Here's where it will work, here's where it won't work. Let's, let's not try to replace all funding. Yes? When you talk about building a follow-on market, mm -hmm. what does that entail? So sometimes it is working with regulators, right? And to try to take down some of those barriers. Sometimes it's bringing everybody together to, to do that. Um, sometimes it's just proving to the public what's possible. We almost launched an autonomous automobile prize a few years ago. And at the time, we knew they were coming. The market was moving unimpeded. And, but the regulators and insurance companies were like, no. And so we wanted to prove that, this, that they are safe and that they could travel across the country and they could do all this stuff. And so we had the funding, we were gonna launch it. And Nevada said, you know what? We're gonna, we're gonna issue a, a license plate for autonomous automobiles. And then Hawaii said, you know what? We're gonna do it too. And we said, we don't need to do this anymore. The regulatory hurdle was just surpassed. There's no point in the rest of doing a prize. We're going to be, we're working on an artificial intelligent prize, a market where there's so much money being spent that it wouldn't make any sense for us to do an artificial intelligent prize, except that the public is so afraid of artificial intelligence, right? Hugely afraid. I mean, when you have Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking saying stuff about it, it freaks people out. And they have all this dystopian narrative in movies and TV shows and that kind of thing. So the only reason to do it is to change that public perception so that people are more comfortable with it. So, so there's lots of different ways you can do it. Yeah? So regarding this autonomous vehicle, mm -hmm. like that was a prize that you guys stopped before it really got... We didn't even launch it. Did you, do you have any examples of the time you guys launched the prize yeah. and it just didn't work out? And, and Absolutely. I'm mean, interested in knowing how, like, when did, how did you guys realize that it just wasn't working? And then what did you guys learn from that? So we fail all the time normally fail before we launch something. We've only, we've only canceled one prize, but we've extended two. So our Google Lunar Prize should have ended two years ago. And we actually, the teams were making so much progress and they have verified launch contracts, which is important because you wouldn't spend a million dollars to sign a launch contract unless you were sure you were gonna go to the moon. Um, so, um, so we extended it based on that because we just, got the time wrong. Our Qualcomm Tricorder X prize is handheld health diagnostic. We gave the teams a lot of time to develop technologies. Many of them were from outside the industry. We assumed they had to deliver us 30 prototypes that we could test on humans. And we assumed they were all going to test on humans before they gave it to us. We learned they didn't have enough time to test on humans before they gave it to us. So most of their, or, or they didn't know how to get humans to test on, just as important. Um, we didn't educate them enough on that. And, and in that case, we extended the competition to give them. They made so much progress, and they were good, but they weren't as good as we wanted to. So we could have said nobody won, or we could have said, you know what? The market's not there yet. Here's another eight months or a year or whatever we're giving it. One where we actually canceled was called the Archon Genomics X Prize. This was an X Prize to rapidly sequence genomes. When the first genome was sequenced, it was $3 billion. We were asking people to do it for, I think, under $1,000 by a certain date. Um, we, um, what we didn't realize was with exponential technologies, right, the cost went down drastically. By 2021, it's gonna cost one penny to sequence the human genome. Every single child is not gonna leave the hospital without having their 
genome sequence. Right now, I think it's less than a, less than a few hundred dollars. So, so we just got it wrong, absolutely wrong. But we had no way of knowing. So now we've, what we've learned from it is we design things in there to allow us to take late entrance along the way, because the market might be moving quicker than us. Um, we design things in there to be things to be first to achieve versus everybody show up at the same time so that you're going to rush to do it. Um, so we, there's a lot of elements we can design into to avoid that. Yes? Related to my discussion earlier about how you decide what prizes to, to or challenges to tackle, mm -hmm. do you have a process where you're scanning the landscape and saying, you know, AI and autonomous driving and all of that is, are coming up and so we'll find something? Or is it that Google comes to you and when she comes to mm -hmm. you? So both. <laughs> So I would say 50% of our prizes are a philanthropist or a corporation comes to us and says, we have an interest in this, do you? And then we look at it and say, yeah or no. Um, and then at the end of the day, again, we have to prove what the prize is, so, so we make sure it's good. And sometimes we have interest and we go find somebody to fund it. So what time do we have until? I want to make sure, just until 1245? Yeah. Yeah. So, so I will, let me go through really quickly and then I'll take the rest of the questions. So I just want to give you a case study. So does everybody remember this? Maybe it's easier to see it here, 2010, <laughs> right? In the corner of your screen, for 87 days, you watch that thing spew. And at the beginning, you're like, we got this. Like, this is easy. And then like day 30, you're like, um, seriously? And then it like got to the surreal, and you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, this may never stop. So here's just some images of it. So we launched the prize afterwards. Um, to develop technologies to better clean up surface oil, surface oil. What happened during Deepwater Horizon is that the technology that they used to clean that up was the same technology that they used in Exxon Valdez 22 or 23 years earlier. Not only the same technology, the same exact equipment that they went and they scrubbed off the, the cobwebs and took it out of mothballs and shipped it down to the Gulf and cleaned up. Now that makes sense, because hopefully you don't have a lot of oil spills that you don't need to innovate. But there was no incentive for the industry to innovate. At the time, those, those technologies got about 1,200 gallons per minute of how fast they took oil off the surface, right? Obviously, the faster you could take oil off the surface, the faster you could clean things up. So we said, you know what, can we do something about this? So we designed a prize that would be won in 15 months, and all you had to do was have the highest oil recovery rate, that's how fast you put it on the ship, two times greater than the industry standard. So the industry standard was 1,200 gallons per minute. We were asking for 2,500 gallons per minute. Remember, 1,200 gallons per minute had been around for 20-something years. And we're asking you to do better in, in 15 months. And then also you had to be better about how much water versus oil came into the, onto the ship. So, Ships get filled up, they have to come back to shore. So you want to have all oil, no water. And so we were asking to say 70% oil, 30% water. And it was whoever did best on top of that, okay? So we found this, the only place in the world where you can have, you can test oil cleanup technologies at scale, which is on a US Naval base in New Jersey. By the way, interesting story, you can't actually go put oil in the ocean and then clean it up. People don't really like that. Um, so we found the only place where you could actually dump a ton of oil in there. We spent a million dollars to rent this place, and we had a million dollars in donated oil. The teams paid less than $5,000 in a registration fee, and the top 10 teams each got 10 days there. That's back to that testing, those incentives, right? Two teams bested the criteria. The winning team got 4,500 gallons per minute. The industry standard for 20-something years was 1,200 gallons per minute. They got 4,500 gallons per minute. Actually, we're able to bring it up to like 6,000 gallons per minute, but it was shooting water onto the ship so much that the ships were listing that they had to like back it off, right? And now they're back up again. Um, and the majority did better than, than the industry standard in one or the other, which is, which is huge. And all these had a different thing. Remember I talked about the guy with the fishing net? He didn't do good at all. But you know what? He could have had that dispatched instead of waiting for weeks, right? And it really proved prize theory, That's the stuff I was talking about earlier. There were supposed to be three awards, but only two bested, and so we only gave out a first and second. About seven million was spent by teams for a $1.4 million prize. Um, we, had, we had four newcomers to the, to, the, to the industry. 
who did significantly better than the industry standard. And the teams really competed for that, for that testing and that glory. Very few competed for the money, which was, which was wonderful. So that's just a little story. So I'm almost right on time. I'm happy to answer any additional questions. But I will just leave with you with what do you want to make possible? And so you know, this is why philanthropists love this stuff, because of the, the model itself and how it could help them. But remember, it doesn't work for everything, so I want to be clear about that. So I could take more questions now. There's more questions, but feel free to leave if you have to leave. I will not be offended in the slightest. Questions? Thank you. Yes. I just had a question about um, conflict of interest with yeah. your uh, clients, as you call them. So say Google, you know, they have mm -hmm. this Twitter uh, prize, and are there uh, restrictions on who can enter that prize? Yes. Yeah, so, so there, well, there's, in that case, there's ITAR restrictions, which is the US government's uh, space restrictions on like working with China or, or um, Iran or a bunch of other places where we are afraid technology is going to get stolen when it's for national security reasons. Um, but would that, like, would Google say we don't want a team? From no, no, our sponsors have no say in that. But our sponsors also can't invest in any of the teams during the competition. Other people can invest in them, but our sponsors can't invest in them. There are ways that teams can compete if they already had some of our sponsors' money. We put up a, a wall. Um, but it's more about, legally, we can do anything. It's more about perception and what the other teams will think. And so we try to take a very, very, there's a lot of gray area, and we try not to play in the gray area. We try to, we try to stay. Now, going forward, because we're getting more and more corporate sponsors, we're being forced to play in the gray area a little bit more, and we're comfortable with that. You know, we protect ourselves and we protect the teams. Um, but if you have a philanthropist or, or a foundation, there's never a gray area. It's just with corporations. And we'll have to learn, because that's where the money's coming from. Yes? Um, for the people who are investing sort of in this sort of crowdfunding mm -hmm. So you're talking about the people investing in the teams, right? Yes. Yeah. So um, that is more about the team versus the competition, right? And so they'll be investing because they think the management of that team is strong, or they'll be investing because they really like the technology of that team, or whatever it may be. We do actively try to align our prizes to complement other funding sources. So for example, we know what kind of data is interesting to VCs, right? And so we collect that data from the teams. We don't make it public without the teams uh, allowing us to. But we may say, we have a VC. Are you comfortable? All teams opt in. We can share that information with them. And they'll either say yes or no, under an NDA and stuff like that. So we try to make it as easy as possible to bring that money. We also try to, if we know of certain grants or contracts out there, like the government's doing a lot of grants and renewable energy or whatever, we will actually pay attention to those and try to make sure that those grants could be a stepping stone on the way to our prize so that those teams could access that money along the way. Now, we can't guarantee they will. We can't really help them, though we'll often bring those people in to talk about it. Um, but our goal is to have them, have them be able to access other sources of revenue throughout the process. Yeah. It's a very good question. We ask ourselves that all the time. Um, it's because how we were formed, if, if we had to do over again, we would not be a nonprofit. I mean, I come, I come from, I don't come from, this is my first nonprofit job. We run ourselves like a company or private sector and all that. Um, it, being a nonprofit complicates a lot of things for us. And we actually spun off a for-profit called HeroX. Um, they do much smaller prizes and we own most of them so we can get funding back to us much, much, much like National Geographic does and a bunch of other organizations do. Um, but I bet you if we did it again, we wouldn't be in that profit. Because then we'd be able to keep a piece of the IP of the teams that would self-fund itself, et cetera, et cetera. Yes? Well, I guess I'm playing on that. What, are the, what is the value of a nonprofit? Do people trust you differently? I mean, how are they so, so the value is that when people fund a prize, there's, we are very careful about making sure there's no private benefit. Um, and as long as there's no private benefit, then their money test is a write-off. But with corporations, it's a marketing write-off or a business expense anyway, so that's, 
it's neither here nor there. We don't, we are still figuring out what that benefit is. I think people like us more though. Yeah. Do the prize winners always pay cash or are they ever uh, somehow reinsure the prize or come up with some other derivative? In our case, it's, they pay cash um, because they don't get any of the IP. Um, there are lots of competitions out there where like the prize purse is actually coming into the organization and being incubated or whatever it may be, right? There's lots of very successful prizes that don't give any money at all. We give money because um, one, we think it cuts through the media and the, the marketing noise. Um, if you have big numbers, that we won't do anything under a million dollars because we wanna make sure we can cut through that noise. Um, but there's lots of very successful prizes that are incubators or um, <coughs> partnerships or whatever it may be. Netherlands? Yes. Everybody, no, I'm not in Culver City. So I'm in Washington, D.C. because um, I wouldn't move. Uh, we are becoming more and more um, virtual. So we probably have 12 or 15 people that are not in Culver City and the other 60 or so are in Culver City. We have, um, you guys probably have them here, Beams, like the robots that you can log into and drive around the office and it's a video conference. but. But, it's, but I control it so I can go up to you and walk down the hallway with you. So we have things like that. What's, what's nice about being a nonprofit, actually one of the benefits of being a nonprofit is we have so many people donate us cool toys. Like we have 3D printers that were very expensive and beams that are $20,000 each that we got for free. And mostly they're doing it because so many high powered people come through our offices so that they can sort of showcase their products but they're very beneficial to us. So yes, we don't have to be in LA. So the team's only like 75 people? No, yeah, that's big. When I started, we were 35, five years ago. What was your experience prior to so I, so I did an MBA in Master's of Environmental Science at Duke, um, came out and I worked in startups within corporations in the energy industry, um, and then ended up in management consulting, an organizational change, and then was brought into XPIES to, as a consultant, and then it just kind of stuck. But at that time, they wanted everybody to move, and that's why I refused to move. And it took them a long time to hire me because of it. <laughs> Excellent. Any other questions? Huh? Yes. Oh, yes. Uh, how, when, how and when did you guys sort of start shifting uh, from just technology prizes uh, to prizes that sort of showcase the So we, Peter would argue that we were always, all of our technology prizes were also always helping people because we would have another place to go, right, if we screwed up this, this planet. Um, but we are, so we were space, right, and then we start, realized that we had a very cool tool, so we became topic agnostic, tool specific, and started expanding. So probably about five years ago. Um, now we're actually looking outside of prizes. So if we learn anything from exponential technologies, if you don't disrupt yourself, you're gonna get disrupted. Um, and prizes are very, very popular right now, but they're not gonna be popular forever. So we're you know, looking at ways, can we become an incubator, a, a traditional incubator? Can we do this? Can we take IP? Can we do other things outside of prizes? But now we have this strong brand and a strong platform, there's, there's lots of other things we could do. So we're, we're going through that right now. We constantly go through that. So thank you guys. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Appreciate it. So, Chris, did the founder ever get up in space? He he has not. Um,